My name's Kirsty. Um, I'm an environmental consultant working for Albert um, for a number of years on a range of projects um, and most latterly chairing that uh, working group on biodiversity. Um, I'm joined by, very delighted to be joined by Amelia Price um, from Sustainable Film, um, who's also been involved in the working group and pulling together this guide with me. She's got nearly 20 years experience in the film industry, um, starting out as production and location coordinator, but um, taking a bit of a change of direction to co-found a sustainability consultancy, um, specialising in working with film companies, productions and studios. So as we go through the session, I'm going to be relying heavily on her very expertise on the ground experience to sort of give you some practical examples and explain what some of this might mean in practice. Um, as Siobhan said, we do encourage your questions. Please do use the Q&A function. Um, we're going to hopefully keep this reasonably informal, so we're happy to answer some questions as we go. But if we miss them, we will pick them up at the end. Um, so, yes, I think we're all here to talk about the biodiversity in the screen industry's new production guide. Um, and so we'll go straight to the report itself. Um, this came about, this guide, um, really as a result of various discussions that we had about how productions are becoming more and more conscious about their carbon footprint. Um, there's been great strides there and great efforts taking place, but we're in danger potentially of leaving biodiversity and nature um, aside. And we now know that those two need to go hand in hand. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But we wanted to look and consider how our industry might be impacting on biodiversity and what it is we can do about it and really up some of the engagement level um, on that. So what does the guide cover? Um, it covers that very much that sort of basic, um, what is biodiversity, um, the facts around it, explaining that to you, why it should matter to the screen industry, biodiversity and climate change, how they're linked, as I mentioned, the legal requirements, um, screen industry impact, how we impact, and then a checklist of ideas which we'll talk you through. But before we go into it all, I really want to sort of pause just for a second and find out where you guys are coming from and what biodiversity means in your work life, whether you've come across it. So if you can just take a couple of seconds there to, to answer whether you've considered biodiversity in your work life up to now, just to tick whichever box feels most relevant to you, and then we can come back to that. Super. That's great. OK, so we're seeing from the results there that there are actually a good number of you that are constantly thinking about biodiversity making changes, which is incredibly positive. And then others who are sort of sometimes trying to make some changes. That's the sort of the, the largest number of groups there and others who are sort of sometimes but don't know where to start. Um, and I'm hoping for that group and for those that are that it might occasionally cross their mind to or haven't yet thought about that this session will help with that. Um, Amelia, I've not brought you in yet. Just before we get into this sort of detail of, of the guide itself, um, you've obviously been part of the Albert Working Group. Um, why do you think it is important that the industry um, is considering this and pays a bit more attention to biodiversity? Well, I, I think one of the main things is um, the fact that it has, as a topic, it's huge. It's so broad ranging from everything from the supply chain of all, the, of all the various materials that we buy to how we behave when we're out on locations in sensitive, sensitive locations like Triple SI. And it's one of those things that, you know, even if we're just starting to touch the surface of this as a topic, then it really will kind of just start to break down and, and help us all approach it kind of in a more cohesive way I guess there's just so much for us to cover and at the moment it feels as an industry it's something that we're really not thinking about I think from sustainability we are we generally look at where our big environmental impact is which is you know we talk about fuel and flights and travel an awful lot but we have such a big reach across so many different aspects of an, as a different industries that we really need to be thinking about this too we can't just be thinking about the, the obvious things it's, it's got to go further than that. Thanks, Amelia. Great. And hopefully we'll pick up some of those exact points as we go through. So if we consider what we, as I said, this is what the guide will cover. You can see that on the screen. But what exactly is biodiversity? I mean, it's one of these words that's now in sort of popular parlance. But 
Um, we, you know, no, it's not necessarily understood. I think people tend to think it's butterflies, it's bees, it's birds, but obviously it's much more than that. It's literally everything that all the living things that make up our planet, including ourselves, we're not separate from biodiversity. I think that's a key point to make. And we really do rely on it for our life and livelihoods. Um, I think it's important to note that like 50% of global GDP is dependent on nature. So this isn't just about that sort of nice sort of sense of nature we have. It is about our livelihoods. And if we run through some of the facts about biodiversity, um, we move on the slide there, you can see that, you know, it, it can come across as a little do doom and gloom biodiversity is declining faster now than any point in human history. Just this week, we've had the UK State of Nature report coming out, showing us that nearly one in six species in the UK alone is threatened with extinction. Um, globally, the stats are even worse. We've seen an, an average 60% decline in global populations of mammals and fish, birds, etc. Since 1970, 25% of species threatened. And as I've said, this all in the background that it really is essential for our human life it's where we get our medicines it's where we get um the water we breathe the food we eat um and it's so it is such a critical crit excuse me critical thing for all of us we also know that where biodiversity is working well it can be a real positive healthy ecosystems can store carbon and help protect, protect us from climate change we'll talk a little bit more about how these two things interact because climate change also impacts on biodiversity in numerous ways through temperature rises, flooding, wildflowers and drought. And they're in a very much a, a loop where they're so interconnected. So we do need to recognise that we won't be able to reach any of our net zero climate targets without considering biodiversity and that there's a lot of global movement around this at the UN's um, COP on biodiversity in 2022. We saw a commitment to protect 30% of the world's land by 2030 and that's been taken on at UK so this this is at this stage feels like a very big fact that is hard to pin down to why this is relevant to us as the screen industry um but maybe we if we move on we can we can see that this does relate to us why should we care about it well one there is that sort of moral obligation for all of us as individuals and as a sector to play our part we've seen the devastating statistics but we do also, um, are, we're far more connected to it than we might think. Our supply chains are dependent on biodiversity, whether that's for the materials we use in sets, for our batteries that we put in our cameras, for the water that we use. Um, our business is fundamentally underpinned by biodiversity. Um, we also can reap potential cost savings if we reduce our resource use from thinking about that supply chain. Um, and we shouldn't forget that we have some legal requirements here. There are nature laws that mean we have to take care of this and that they will be coming. Um, and then on top of all of that, we've got a responsibility to our viewers um, and an opportunity to help inform our viewers um, about biodiversity. So there's a whole range of reasons why as an industry we can be getting involved in that. And then as I've said before, now you're seeing on the screen, there's a real interaction between climate change and biodiversity. And as a sector, we've been fantastic at moving forward. Albert's main reasons to date has been to sort of drive change around climate change, to help our sector be at the forefront of reducing carbon emissions. But as I've said, the two are very linked. Um, I won't go into the full um, image you've got here that's a great one from WWF to show you how they're connected. But as I was saying, we can see that climate change will drive nature loss, but also that nature loss drives climate change. The two are in, t in a negative loop there or can be positive. If we protect biodiversity, it can help us cut emissions. If we all interact well with it, with if we reduce our carbon emissions, we can help improve biodiversity. We need to get to that positive side of that loop um, in order to be able to go forward. As I mentioned, there's the legal requirements um, this is for the UK. It's great to see that there's lots of people joining us from different countries around the world, and these will differ depending on where you're based. Um, but there's lots of um, protected land and habitats, whichever part of the world you'd be in, that are covered by regulation. Um, that mean the protected species, protective plants in very specific sites. And as productions 
um, and in our area, we need to make sure that we are, have permission to film in areas or don't film in specific areas where we might cause damage. We also know that there's a now a new Environment Act in the UK, which was the world's first legally binding target to end nature loss by 2030. That's going similarly, that's mirroring what's happening globally, and that's going to bring in new legislation and new requirements and regulations, which we'll need to keep an eye on as we go forward. So we shouldn't forget that while a lot of this is things that are nice to do, where we do actually have requirements around this. And Amelia, I wonder if you think that those legal obligations are something that are widely known about. I think sadly not. I mean, it, it's uh, we often talk about the way that sustainability is very similar to health and safety. And and I think, again, probably 10 years ago, health and safety wasn't as widely looked at as it is now and more accepted on set. And now we tend to have a health and safety person standing by. And I feel like the legal aspects of environment environmental laws are, will hopefully go the same way because it is complex and there's a lot to it and there's a lot of different areas. And actually, we probably, as an industry, need to be saying, you know, we know that we should, we should be doing better, but we actually we need to get help. We need to get experts in in each of these fields who can explain and break down the legislation so that we are using it more on set as we should be and not just set there's you know there's there's legalities around waste transfer and making sure you've got a waste transfer note at the point that any of your waste is taken away from site and that happens most of the time but still not all of the time and that's should be a really simple piece of legislation that's adopted and sadly it, it's not it's not kind of we don't have that same robust systems that they might in other industries so it's definitely something we need to be looking at we probably need to explore the ways in which we can support people a lot better with it thanks and i really like that um parallel with health and safety because i think we all sort of take that for granted now that there are things that we'll do that will be carrying out risk assessments that will be wearing the hard hat when we need to and that that's just a given and happens and it'd be great i think with biodiversity for us to get to a place where that is just part of what you think about straight off the bat. Yeah, the risk assessments is exactly that. We should be doing environmental risk assessments and environmental management plans for every single location that we go to. But most of the time when you start and try and have those conversations, a lot of people sort of go, oh my God, that sounds like a whole lot of extra work. But actually, a lot of it is just tying together the work that we're all doing. It's just everybody's doing it separately in their different departments. And we need to be bringing it together so that we can build a better picture of what the impact is of a shoot at a location. Great. Thanks, Amelia. And if we think about what those impacts actually are um, of the screen industry, I think you you mentioned location there. That's the sort of the direct impacts um, on the ground, whether that's damage and disturbance to the land you're on, whether that's waste that's there. But I think maybe what's less thought about is the, the, the two on either side of that, but sort of the upstream, the supply chain, which you've mentioned. So that's all the materials from productions can impact on biodiversity, whether that's costumes, that's catering, sets, props. And we need to be thinking about that. And then on the downstream side as well, what's what we're putting out on screen? Um, and I'll pick this up towards the end of the session. But, you know, sort of are we increasing demand for products? Are we showing damaging ingredients? Are we increasing visitor numbers? How are we portraying species? I think it shows that across the piece um, we are impacting and that's not sort of looking organisationally where um, com companies within this sector might be doing in terms of pensions or planning developments, which can all again pick up impacts in relation to biodiversity. So how do we mitigate those biodiversity impacts? And what you can see in front of you now is a, a, what's called a mitigation hierarchy, which you may be familiar with from this or from other sectors but I guess ultimately what we want to do is avoid ha having any biodiversity impacts but where we can we need to reduce the impacts that we're having where there are impacts we need to look at how we can regenerate or restore from what the what we've done um, and then I think the bit that hasn't been brought up yet is the transform how we can have a positive impact we shouldn't see this all as the negative piece and I know Amelia is going to pick up some positive impacts as we go through as well, some positive examples, because we have a a lot of a, a skill set and opportunities often to improve the biodiversity of places that we are, particularly on location. And so we'll pick that up too. But Amelia, we're going to talk through each of those elements in the, the checklist. The checklist sets out um, what actions a production could do 
um, in relation to sort of the main drivers of biodiversity loss and it picks them out in relation giving sort of showing what could be avoided what could be reduced regenerated restored etc um but i think it's worth saying at the outset that we're not saying that everything within this checklist is relevant to every production um that not everybody's going to be using fake snow and having elaborate costumes um we wanted to set out sort of all the ideas that we could um and make it as a sort of pick and mix it's designed to be a tool that's used rather than a uh, sort of a tool that feels onerous to people and I just wanted to say that at the outset um if we look at sort of the first sort of biggest driver of biodiversity loss which is land use change which is responsible for nearly a third of all biodiversity decline um in relation to the the screen industry we can see that we might impact on that in a number of ways um Amelia if we start with catering do you want to give some sort of ideas of how we can reduce our impacts on that both sort of directly and also sort of effective ways of thinking about that in our value chain? Yeah, well, yes, I think let's get the uh, the meat-free day conversation out early because it, it's one that comes up a lot to, when talking about sustainability. I think we're all aware that you know industrial meat is um, one of the biggest causes of deforestation globally. So obviously that's our supply chain further down, and the impact or the effect that that has sort of on a day-to-day -day basis on the set is how we can reduce red meat content in catering and some of the larger productions the the catering and the amount of people that we're feeding and the volume of food is huge so it's not an you know it's, it's not a small number that we're talking about just to reduce it to one day but as i think many people have probably experienced so some of the other people on the webinar as well is that it is very much something that people feel really strongly about and can be quite divisive so this we are very aware is a massive impact, but it's one that seems to be a real pinch point in terms of how we progress and the effect that other impacts can have on the rest of the production. So it's one of those things that's really important, but we can't get hung up on it because it does seem to have such a negative impact. Then you tend to sort of almost lose the room in the conversation when you're talking to the crew about other things. If you've upset them by taking away meat for a day, then you know, you're also not going to be able to talk to them about what vehicles they're using and the and the tools and the other equipment that they're bringing onto sites. So we kind of have to find a way to almost subtly reduce the meat content because we have to. That's that sort of there's no two ways about it. We have to make that change, but we have to do it in a way that is bringing people on board so that then we can look at everything else. There's there's a lot we can do around the catering and the catering setup and the vehicles that they use and how they're cooking. Um, it's not just everything that they're purchasing, but again if they're buying their fruit and veg locally from local markets obviously that's not necessarily always possible but they can look at the way that they're purchasing and hopefully again reducing the plastic and the packaging that they're getting because if you're an, on location then you can see boxes and piles and piles of packaging from the caterers and that can be one day that they're filling bins and again obviously then rubbish becomes a, a knock-on effect um, of the catering it, it can be on the larger shows a real area of issue yeah thanks amelia yeah i think it's, it's it's an ongoing issue and as um sylvia's just said in the chat it can be the biggest thing we can do to tackle biodiversity loss agriculture is such a such well is the major cause of biodiversity loss and how we interact with that is is really key i think some of the other things that are on this slide particularly i think feel more obvious vehicles and structures you can see that if you're going to drive over a precious bit of blanket bog, that you might have an impact on it um, or damaging land features and water courses. You know, if you're knocking down the side of a stream or, or adding sediment to it or different things that you might do, digging ditches, they all feel a little bit obvious. Costume and clothing to me like sounds like it might stand out for people. A costume designer might have come to this. It would be great to hear if there's anybody on the webinar that does work in costume that sort of goes, well, how does... How do, as a costume designer, do, do I need to think about biodiversity um, when it comes to my role in the screen industry? And I don't know if you want to pick that one up as well. Yeah, I, I think you're right that costume feels like an area that is almost quite an exciting one to start exploring what that 
supply chain looks like for, in terms of the farming of cotton and other fabrics? And, and is there a way that we could be using different fabrics? Um, I know there's a lot of costume designers who work really well in terms of particularly on the recurring TV series and how they're repurposing and reusing material so that we're lessening the impact, which can be really exciting. Sometimes you know you talk to costume teams now and they're doing incredible things with leftover bits of metal to make jewellery that and they're finding the metal kind of from areas around site from other departments even and, and they can kind of melt things down and remould it. And that's really exciting to see that reuse and that sort of circular economy happening because the impact of that is actually huge. If we are not consuming more and purchasing more, then if starts it it's saves us money but also it means that our impact on the wider um kind of biodiversity of the costume supply chain is, is potentially massively reduced yeah no absolutely i think um cotton i think it's becoming much more known how sort of potentially damaging to biodiversity cotton can be through its water and pesticide use particularly and as you say if we're looking at ways we can recycle repurpose clothing um that that is definitely a way we need to go forward but I think it goes beyond just the costumes itself doesn't it it's also like how are the costumes washed are they releasing microplastics into the environment or are it is there washing happening on location where's that wastewater going there's so many aspects that we can just pull out pull out just from costume and clothing that shows us how hopefully people realize that every almost every role within our industry is going to be having an impact on biodiversity um if we look at one of the the other areas, if we look at over exploitation, um, that if we move on in the slide, um, there also you know that's responsible for twenty percent of biodiversity decline, and there's some other issues um, around that that connected to it. There's obviously fossil fuel fossil fuel usage is a big thing and can have it, its extraction can have an impact on biodiversity in itself whether that's tar sands or other developments and we've covered fossil fuels extensively with Albert from the climate point of view but I think what other sort of areas of exploitation occur are things that impact more directly on biodiversity which is around the materials that we use in our location and in set construction and batteries. So with set construction, we know that the type of plywood that can lead to sort of deforestation in different parts of the world that then has the knock-on impact of biodiversity. We know that batteries, while they're going to be essential to transition away from fossil fuels, um, can also have major impacts in terms of the mining of the raw materials for them. And we need to look at opportunities to use main supply when we can, to look at recharging batteries, to recycling batteries, so that we're keeping those minerals in the supply chain rather than sort of creating the need for virgin supplies. So they're all things that we can think about in terms of that over exploitation one. If we look at pollution, which we come on to next, which when combined with climate change is responsible for 14% of biodiversity decline. And that is growing, I should say. Climate change is increasingly going to keep knocking on um, the door of the, the, the top ones here. Um, we often speak about pollution in sort of terms of fumes or air pollutants, but there really are other ways that pollution is impacting biodiversity through the screen industries. So the waterways, when we look at that one, uh, waterways are waste. Um, they might be the ones that we're thinking more obviously about sort of danger of spills from fuel, from pa paint, from other contaminants um, or waste sort of both on location or how we're contributing to landfills, which in themselves can negatively impact on biodiversity. But it's those two middle ones, that sort of light and sound for me, which are quite interesting as well to bring out the sort of the additional ones, the ones that aren't going to impact in on climate and waste in the way that we've already been thinking about traditionally. Um, it feels like these are much more specific to our industry and maybe areas that sort of natural history productions have already thought about quite a lot in the past in terms of to catch the right film. But coming back to you, Amelia, I think, is there a way, examples that you can sort of think of that where these have been reduced this sort of light and sound pollution can be reduced without impacting on the creative because i think people think light and sound that like, goes hand in hand with productions so that you need those things yeah i think particularly night shoots are always quite problem problematic in this area because you know obviously we need to you know, even though it's a night shoot and you want it to be dark you still need to light so and obviously that's when you start to really interfere with 
local um, and wildlife and, and things in the local area. So I, I guess the first point is to make sure that we're always do, getting a specialist and ecologist in to do a survey of the local area, because we might think we know as you stand there in daytime, oh, God, you know, I think there's bats in this area. But until we know and actually get that, gather that information, then we can't properly mitigate and work out how we can best look after the, the local environment that we're filming in. Um, one thing I've seen done quite successfully recently is where obviously we have our set light and, and everything that happens but obviously behind the scenes we we can have huge amounts of trucks and trailers and people and lighting required with tower lights so that people can see where they're going and how they get to the car park i've seen people use, sort of use red light sort of directed at, at the floor um or kind of around pathways most recently much more effectively and actually just that difference of having a red light rather than a bright light a bright a bright white light is much more subtle and so it doesn't have the same impact on wildlife i'm sure there's sort of probably a few other things that actually maybe we should be bringing the gaffers and the sparks into this conversation because they're the lighting experts at the end of the day and maybe they'll there's things that they know about that they do on set that actually can be helping benefit the local environment as well similarly with sound um I think we do talk a lot about batteries and how batteries near sets are, are actually really good for powering. And that's where the, the smaller batteries are working really well, not just because the sound department prefer it, um, because obviously there's no big generators chugging away, but it is quieter for everybody, not just us, but the people, you know, if we're filming in a city, people prefer it because not not disturbing them. But obviously that is the goes, same, same goes for the wildlife wherever we're filming. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really critical. And I think, as you said, we could also learn and we can learn from others on this. Um, you mentioned sort of the gaffers and the spark. I think we can learn a little bit more from natural history itself, who have deliberately gone out to film in a way that doesn't disturb wildlife. And I think sort of exploring that a little bit more, we know that like nighttime lighting or nighttime or anytime sound can sort of impact with how animals feed and migration their behavior different things but I think the danger I feel across all of these pieces is that people will see this as sort of the natural fit within the natural history remit but I guess as you've pointed out like sound can impact on people and it can impact in other places it isn't just sort of out in beautiful locations filming bats at night time really is it it's it's across the piece yeah definitely I, th I think there's just so many different areas that we might think we're kind of doing a good job of keeping our footprint small and, and actually we really need to be making sure that we're kind of liaising with experts who really know exactly what's going on underneath us at that specific time of year as well it's sort of to, that you know it's things like ground nesting birds might only nest in one area at a specific time of year and unless we have those experts who know the local area then it's very, you know, we, as a film crew, you're, you're not necessarily going to be there for 12 months of the year. You might only be there for a specific time period. And actually, maybe if you think about when you're going to be in an area, then that will also benefit if you can speak to the local um, experts and people, the landowners often as well, and, to, and just work out when's the best time to film there. Yeah, no, absolutely. And just sort of having a quick look at the chat while you're saying that and seeing one there from Simon Neville saying quite sort of the, the opposite that they've actually been asked to scare birds away as they're picking up them up on the sound sort of that um maybe the a less good example of what we should be doing um if we go on to the sort of the final area on the checklist and we can always come back to all of these in the questions if there's particular areas people want to bring out but the final one on the on the checklist is alien species which isn't anything to do with sort of NASA's new drive to find out about um, UFOs it's to do with sort of the invasive non-native plant species uh, which are actually responsible for 11% of biodiversity decline and we might feel that that's quite far removed from our industry but obviously we do bring greens and greenery onto sets and into locations quite frequently to dress and it is about making sure that whatever we bring into those locations has got a plant passport that isn't isn't a non-invasive uh, isn't an invasive species that's non-native that might somehow get into a water course or into the land because they can have such huge um, impacts on biodiversity as well as increasing cost for agriculture and forestry. And so we do need to think about that too. Um, so that that's sort of the a very quick run through of the checklist that's in there. And as I said, we can pick back up. That's very much focused on production. I would just like to touch 
quickly on sort of the biodiversity on screen, um, which is an area that we're hoping as Albert to lean into more as we go forward. But just to think about how productions can can impact on biodiversity from what we portray on the screen. There's obviously the location and there's some been very well um, documented examples of where that's gone wrong. Um, the beach, the film, um, has had a massive negative impact on the, on the actual beach where that was filmed in Thailand. With by showing beautiful locations, you drive people to want to see it. I live um, not very far from the Glenfinnan Viaduct where Harry Potter was um, filmed, and I see a massive increase in the number of people coming to see that. With the example of the beach, not only was it sheer visitor numbers, it was that those visitors were then swimming um, with sun cream on and the sun cream has impacted the coral reef there so it's about thinking about where you're filming and what implications that may have um, once that goes out on the screen um, there's also about the products that you show on screen as well um, in the same way that we talked about supply chain if you're a cookery show and you're showing ingredients that are biodiversity damaging and encouraging people to buy them then you're going to have a responsibility around that and there's how you sort of portray um animals as well um on sc on screen there's there can be positive and negatives of that there's a really nice positive example of where the jungle book um include the most recent ad um on screen adaptation of that included a pangolin um as one of their characters which is a rare endangered species and that actually really increased the awareness of that species um in a positive way that's driven people to sort of join campaigns to save the pangolin and so it can have a really positive impact as well as potentially negative depending how it's portrayed avoid sort of showing human interaction that's about like don't don't show that it's a great thing to go and feed a bear something or <laughs> as in at its most simplest um but there's things around that as well and consider as is, as i've said sort of the opportunities for biodiversity promotion um in your content but among, above all, and I think this plays back to what you were saying, Amelia, in terms of the production side of things, is speak to experts, find out how you best represent biodiversity, put it in its social context, speak to locals where you are to understand any sort of local issues around it. But there's a lot we can do. And as I've said, that's something that we're really hoping to lean into more to build on this work in relation to production practices, to look at the editorial side as well. That really gives us some time now before we finish to look at your questions and please do sort of pop them in the chat because that's what we'll be coming to now um, to draw out a bit more from some of this um, and get a bit more of your insight. I, you know, at the start, many of you said you were interested in this but didn't quite know where to go with it. Some of you said you were already really engaged, but it'd be great to bring out some of those. If I just have a quick look now and... Um, I see the first one that was in there was about is mitigation not a level above avoid. I think is it where we improve biodiversity through the making? I'd like to think so. Um, Amelia, I don't know what you think about that, but I think that ties back into the how can we have a positive impact? How can we, before we think about our impacts, how can we contribute to biodiversity? Sorry, in terms of ecotourism, I got distracted by people in the chat. Sorry. <laughs> that's all right no that that was our i guess overall when we were looking at the mitigation hierarchy we were talking about avoiding having any impacts but somebody's suggesting like even before we get to the avoiding maybe we should think maybe we should reframe it in that positive light yeah definitely i, th I think one thing i would do constantly try and do is, is think of the positive and yes i mean it's it's really it's one of the best things about our job is the fact that we go to go to some amazing locations you know not just around the uk but around the world and show them we can have a really positive impact on a local community in terms of the filming coming in and, and that brings extra revenue and things to a, a local community that might only get visitors at, at during kind of the seaside time of the year so uh, the, during the summer but so that can be a slight positive but obviously the extra footfall but there are ways in which we can do it because i think if you 
you're then filming on a beach and you realize that actually the pathway into the beach is maybe close it is very close to where there's um wildlife you know through the sand dunes then actually is there a way that the film crew can then using the on-hand construction and greens department who we take wherever we go can we build a footpath that can then be that lasting legacy so that more people can enjoy the beach on a day-to-day basis and stop the sort of the general erosion of a a footpath that might be quite small but yeah there are ways to do it and there is a lasting legacy that we can focus on that's one thing another thing that springs to mind is shows we've been working on where they the location they were filming at was in the middle of a managed forest but the forest there was an area in the middle they were using for filming that the forest couldn't be could it was an area it was too boggy they couldn't grow any trees on it so it was always going to sort of sit there essentially in the middle of, of the forest which was great great for filming but then as a lasting impact they actually turned that already quite boggy area into a series of ponds so which and there was um there's a rare dragonfly that lives happens to live in the local forest and now that has an increased biodiversity and a really great lasting impact in the now there's all sorts of other creatures that will be coming and visiting the ponds it improves the local area for people walking walking and enjoying it because it's much nicer rather than just a boggy area of ground now and and also the 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 knock-on effect for the for nature is is fantastic and those are the stories that we should also be telling i think and yes we have a quite a negative impact but we can we have really good resources on a film so such talented people and craftspeople and actually we should really be making the most of them and their skills yeah absolutely I think they're really positive examples Amelia and I'm just seeing from James in the chat as well he's sort of saying could we help by dealing with invasive species which are already there I think that's a great example you've got a lot of bodies on a set and a lot of dying invasive species just needs a lot of people out pulling up Japanese knotweed or whatever else it is and so yeah Himalayan balsam then yeah, these are they're great examples. And I should say at this point as well that there are lots of useful resources around these type of things to sort of say what type of, you know, what are invasive species, all of these useful links, some within the guide itself and others which we'll drop into the chat as we before we finish up. But you do keep looking at those. Um just going to the other the other questions that we've got there. Um, this one goes back to the clothing one. Um, somebody's saying here that they're currently working on a drama show where all the costumes are normal everyday clothes. Um, people are going about their regular lives. How are we still only source about 30 to 40% of our clothes locally in our city of over 100,000? How can we convince or gently nudge production that we should be sourcing everything non-specialised locally? Um, I think that's, yeah, I think that's really interesting one and I guess it's also not necessarily for me it's not necessarily about locally it's about second hand it's about going to the local charity shops ideally and getting them all second hand if it's just everyday clothes so that we're and I think you could use cost as a as an argument there um if you're getting them all second hand from your charity shops and that's going to make it a lot easier um Amelia don't know what other thoughts you have we've got a particular costume we've got some really good costume houses that rent clothing I mean I know maybe the the modern day they don't have quite as much but they've got huge stock so again that rental model is exactly what we should be doing and and just making sure that we're yeah reusing so exactly that to the charity shops and maybe if you do have to buy new is there another way that we can um deal with the problem if you like at the end that kind of solves or reuses more than we normally would obviously giving to charity as well at the at the end of things but I mean costume houses are are, we do have these resources within our within our industry I think often it's often people will say budgets but maybe again if we just open that conversation up and we need to look at things a bit differently it's it's I think there's a lot of things we might quite often go oh that's I've tried it before it doesn't work and actually we just need to try again perhaps or ask the question in a different way yeah, and I think that's becoming more common as well. We're seeing more, you know, Albert itself has its own supplier's guide that suggests places you can go. And yeah, it keeps changing just because you've had a no in the past. Don't assume that that's the case going forward. Um, oh, there's there's a tricky one here, which I don't know if either of us are going to be qualified to answer, but like around the tech recording technologies, which don't rely on rare earth extraction. Um, I think that's always a balance to find a way to how you can have sort of your your film cameras and your sound equipment that doesn't require the minerals that are extracted Uh, we talked about we talked about the need to recycle I think that's a key thing but yes I would say there's massively a need for more research 
in that area I would imagine that hopefully that's coming and it's something that we can push for because that's not just exclusive to our in industry as you mentioned Amelia that's EV cars it's it's everything that's going low carbon at the moment that's technology based is so reliant on on extractive industries and minerals that this is going to be a conversation that keeps going and that we as an industry can feed into I think I don't know if you want to say any more on, on that one yeah, I guess just on, on the battery thing, you're right, it does come up a lot. People saying they don't want to get an electric vehicle because of the impact of the batteries. But then there is already sort of that pipeline exists in terms of people using old electric um, the, uh, batteries from old electric vehicles when the vehicle's been written off, but the battery's still good. And then they're repurposing them and putting them in larger batteries that actually sometimes we're using on film sets. Um, we might just not know that that's what's inside that the box in the corner that we're like great it's a new battery and actually sometimes we're already reusing those materials it's just it's not such an obvious way that it's happening but yeah. the, you know the, the opportunity to do it is there yeah absolutely and talking about that more and making increasing awareness of that's very important got a question here from christopher that i can answer um oh i <laughs> christopher i saw your question there that was around how we how we look at how in terms of how biodiversity plays into the sort of investment and pension side of things and I was going to respond to you by saying there's a great campaign called make my money matter but I see you've when I've scrolled down your question you've also referenced that so BAFTA is a a member and signed up to make my money back matter itself and has encouraged stakeholders to get involved in that so I just encourage others to look at that site make my money matter.co.uk which promotes um much more environmentally and biodiversity sound um, investments and pensions. Um, if we, Maria is asking around how we include awareness around biodiversity loss in screenplays. I think, as I've said, this is an area that we want to do more work on. We want to look more on that editorial side. Albert is already doing a lot on the content side when it comes to climate. We, there's a climate content pledge and a lot of, a lot of stakeholders now looking at how we do that we have tools and resources on our website um that encourage um productions to from the very inception to think about how they might include climate in their storytelling and how they might weave that in whether that's very directly um in narrative and in, in or whether that's more a sort of planet placement by being having wind turbines in the back and we're looking at how we can include but more biodiversity content within that and so watch this space is what I would say on that one. But we do do training, um, editorial training regularly to sort of raise awareness of these issues and how they might be able to be woven in. So if you're interested in that, do look um, on our website for our training courses. Um, how are we doing for time, Siobhan? Um, I'm conscious we're probably getting to that point. Oh, you're on mute. It's only been two years, three years, of that. Um, we are getting towards the end of time, but there are a few things, and there are a couple more in the Q&A to pick up on, but there's also been quite a few people in the chat who've uh, talked about sort of end of end of production and time and recycling and where waste goes. And and I think it's that's just worth picking up on, particularly with you, Amelia, in terms of uh, having enough time and budget or at the end of a shoot, how do productions get that <laughs> if they can and what? resources would you direct them uh what directions would you would you send them in in terms of ways they can effectively manage that sort of end of end of sheet wrap up yeah, i think that's one thing that actually as well we're seeing it's really changing is the the kind of the push for people and support for people to donate things at the end of productions is now possibly the most fun bit of a show is kind of all the department going through all the departments and finding out what it is they need to get rid of and actually this literally came up last week in that there was a whole load of what you just call stuff essentially that production would have put in a bit it was a mixture of you know sort of those lovely HEPA filters that we've now had hundreds of thanks to COVID and bits of wood and half used tins of paint that someone in the studio team were like well we're just going to put it in the skip we worked out the cost of the skip we found a charity who'd take the entire lot and it was actually more expensive to get the skips in to get rid of it all than it was to hire the van to take it to the charity but the production's initial thing was like we're gonna have to pay take for a, a you know pay for a van to take this away we can't pay for that and it's like but you're paying for it whatever and I think often people don't necessarily equate what they're spending on waste with other costs because it's separate bits of the budget it and they just yeah it's a different a different mindset essentially because it's in their head they'll always have to pay for rubbish 
but a truck is a choice that they make. So actually it's just a case of maybe taking that 10 minutes just to do the quick sums and then pr prove it back to them essentially and go, you know what, actually it's cheaper if you literally donate it to a charity who will reuse everything. It's just, some, it, it's, it's always hard at the end because everyone wants to get out of the show really quickly and there's never enough time. So it's sort of almost trying to have that conversation at the start of filming. Before, so you, it gives you a bit of time to almost come up with the ammunition as to those numbers and the, the budget numbers. And because you know, if you can make it win on a budget point of view, then, then it does win pretty much every time. Thanks, Amelia. I think that's a brilliant answer. And I think it ties into the question we've got there from Amelia about how switching to sustainable production practices impacts the budget for production. Is it an increase or a, or a saving? And I think it's clear that there can be savings that's there and it's looking at it in the research. Um, I know we're nearly at, at time. I would just say, want, really want to say that um, the biodiversity working group that Amelia and I are both involved in for Albert are going to continue to look at biodiversity and if there's particular areas or challenges that you feel you have we'd love to hear what they are to see you know how we can help support that. I would just very quickly pick up one of the questions that appeared um, in the Q&A there a second ago was will, will there be sort of a separate Albert um, certification on biodiversity um, I'm really keen that biodiversity isn't sort of siloed, that this is all part of the bigger picture. And so Albert will be looking to bring that into its sort of, it's just normalising it across all of our work um, rather than creating what might feel like another burden for people to consider. We're really here to help on the biodiversity piece is the key message that I want to get across and to look at how we tackle the twin crises of climate and nature together. Um, so, but yes, please do put things in the chat um, that you want, would like us to pick up if there is anything that's in there. That I'm looking forward to going back to that chat because I think there's been loads of re really interesting case studies and examples that I haven't had a chance to look at. Um, but right now I'm going to thank Amelia from me and pass back to Siobhan um, just to wrap up. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you so much to Kirsty and Amelia for uh, their insights this afternoon. Um, as uh, Kirsty has just been just been saying, this is sort of the start of the journey. Um, there's 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 lots uh, to be to be done. And from an event perspective, sort of our next big event uh, with a with a real focus on biodiversity, we are producing a panel at Focus. Um, and that will be in person in London on the 6th of December. And we hope that some of you uh, will join us there. And obviously, sort of all of your insights, input, experiences, once you've sort of all digested the um, guide in great detail, we'd love your feedback because that can help um, help us curate that session as well and sort of really understand sort of the next wave of things that that you want us to be discussing and hopefully we'll have representation there from um some of the production companies um broadcasters that are putting some of these things into place what people are doing and, and what we can be doing to to ensure that we um yeah work together with that the nature loss and and um climate change as Kirsty has been has been speaking about um Kishan's put a load of those um, links in the chat. Again, sort of the biodiversity guide, if you haven't downloaded it again, basically it's all of those slides, but in far more detail um, with, with, with really tangible um, examples on every one of those uh, things on the checklist. It was too, too wordy for a slide on screen, but um, hopefully you'll be able to go through it in your leisure. So uh, thank you everybody. Thank you all for joining us on your lunch hour. Um, any questions, we'll, we'll stick around as you disappear for, for a second, just in case there's any, any sort of last minute things that we need to cover. Um, but otherwise have a great afternoon and. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at another Albert or BAFTA event soon.